Awesome. So Eli, thanks for, for joining us uh, and taking time out of your day to talk to us. Are you in Israel, by the way, right now, or where, where in the world are you? I'm in Albany. Oh, sick. Okay. Very cool. I, I was planning to be over there and then a bunch of stuff came up. Like I have to look for new housing for my postdoc and mm -hmm. I wanted to visit my parents for the new year instead of being like far, far away on a beach. Yeah, that's <laughs> fair. Cool. Well, thanks for you know taking time to join us. Congratulations on completing the PhD. That's definitely a, a goal that I aspire to. And uh, I'm excited for this event. So I'm just going to go ahead and give you the floor. All right. Well, first of all, let me just say something about completing your PhD. You don't complete your PhD. Your advisor runs out of time. <laughs> like, it really is such a war of attrition type thing. And I had actually had a really good advisor. So nonetheless, it's it's tough. Shit's tough. <laughs> All right. So let's maybe get some slideshow going. Yeah. So mostly what I'm going to talk about today is basically just the loose ends and open problems left from completing my thesis. And yeah, good. Good, even the bullets are displaying, very nice. Uh, let's see. Sorry, it's, uh, yeah, just moving you guys over here. Now I can go back to slideshow mode. Okay, so what we're gonna cover is basically why would you wanna do probabilistic programming? What is probabilistic programming? starting from the simple and moving towards the complicated. Then we're really going to ask about the stuff that I mentioned regarding semantics in the title. What does a generative model mean? And what does inference mean? And then we'll just wrap up. So if you're ever wondering, well, why should I do probabilistic programming? The basic answer, at least in my mind, is that there's always been two approaches to the subject of quote unquote artificial intelligence. And actually I'm gonna make a bit of a pun and say, look, there's organic intelligence and there's artificial intelligence. You know, the organic one doesn't have any additives or like GMOs in it. Like you can feed it to your dog, but it is actually harder. That is you have to do a bunch of empirical studies. Then you have to do computational studies to try and write down algorithms for the stuff that you're finding out and to explain the effects that you're finding in your empirical studies. So really one of these approaches is called cognitive science and the other is called AI. And I would say why probabilistic programming? Well, mainly because probability has proven to be over the past 20 to 30 years, one of the big not exactly unifying principles. There's a lot of active arguments over how unifying it is, but it seems to be a major feature of cognition and has been successfully that successfully applied in cognitive science modeling for a long time now. There's a lot that you can explain with it. So I would then say, all right, we should ask ourselves, you know, what do we need to import into computer science in order to explain what's going on in all this cognitive science stuff? And one thing that we have found over the past 20 years was program-like representations that come through in behavior and in cognition and in human cognition in experimental tasks. Similarly, we've found some repeated circuit architectures in sensory cortex that we're now sort of unraveling. My postdoc is gonna be in this and we're beginning to figure out sort of what they're doing as individual pieces. And they do appear to be, again, connected to probability. Then I would even say there's a philosophical angle, which is that probability can sort of mean I guess I'd almost call it three or maybe three to five different things, depending on what your philosophy of probability is. Mm 
I'm pretty orthodox, so I go with you know probability as a measure that norm that integrates to one. But in practice, what that can mean is that sort of prior probability or posterior prob probability on a latent variable is talking about sampling frequency. And probability in terms of likelihood. So a function that connects unobserved things to actual data is sort of a normalized notion of distance. And the neat thing about that normalization is that once you have normalization as in everything, you know, every conditional factor in a probability model integrates to one to eliminate that variable, then you have a kind of common currency. So you're no longer talking about, you know, hand tweaking, like the multiplicative weights on elements of a loss function. You now essentially just have, you know, one probability measure over this big joint construction, and you can turn that into one objective for optimization. Now, speaking of objectives for optimization, it's also noticeable that in standard machine learning, what you might do is minimize the expectation of a loss function where the expectation is taken over a data set so we sample, you know, X's from the data set MathCalD by something like mini batching or by, you know, enumerative iteration. We go over and over and over and over. We, you know, somehow we run an optimization algorithm. We take a step on the parameters theta and we try to minimize it. Now in probabilistic machine learning, we actually relax that to a smooth, a function that sort of smoothly approximates minimization or maximization. It's a sign flip. So you have this notion of negative log expectation exponential. And this basically smooths out the optimization problem, which makes it, as it turns out, computationally significantly easier. Because once it's smoothed out, in a certain sense, once it's smoothed out, you've basically said how approximate is a solution about allowed to be in order to be good? And how much am I trading off approximation quality versus the actual loss function or the actual optimality criterion? So there's a very nice paper out last year where they actually basically said, you know, we, the team author, authoring that paper, it's not my paper, you know, they said, all right, we've worked really hard on sampling algorithms for probabilistic inference and particularly efficient sampling algorithms. So you want to use as little compute as possible to get as good a sample as possible. And then they said, all right, since we've now got these sampling algorithms for discrete probability models, you know, things where you have a probability distribution over one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, say the naturals or a sub interval of the naturals or the integers, but not the reals. And so there may not be the right notion of a gradient to do something like standard gradient descent. And what they said is now that we have a really efficient way to sample from distributions over discrete sample spaces, Let's just try using it to do approximate combinatorial optimization. So like basically let's throw it at problems that are known to be NP hard. <laughs> and they actually got, you know, as you can sort of see here, theirs is this one called ISCO, ISCO. And then they're comparing it against some baselines like you would do in machine learning. And so you have these colored bars and in almost every one of them, ISCO is really close to 1.0 and a higher number here is better. So, and this is, yeah, it's um, maximum cut. It's the maximum cut problem for graphs on a benchmark data set of graphs. <laughs> 
They tested against the alternatives, including, you know, simple greedy approximations being the red bar, you know, and what they find is that this pretty much, you know, good probabilistic sampling to solve this soft or smoothed out optimization problem in a combinatorial space pretty much beats out the competition. And so it, you know, turns out that like, there's a nice way to deal with something like as a good intuition, we can sort of say one thing we often do when trying to solve a hard computational problem is randomize a little bit and try to find a randomized version of the problem that's easier. You know, and what can what's effectively been demonstrated here is that, yeah, if you then instead of just doing sort of uniform randomization, you turn something into an inference problem and then have efficient ways to solve inference problems, the extra bit of smoothing out and, and stochasticity that the inference formulation gives you makes it possible to solve these hard problems fairly efficiently. So with all that said, let's go ahead and dive in. So what is probabilistic programming? And really it's just programming with two extra operators in your language one for randomness, one for data. In this figure here, I'm calling them ppl.sample and ppl.observe. So this is a simplification of one of the already simplest Bayesian network examples given in Judea Pearl's old book. So here we just say there's going to be a piece of data and a parameter passed in, we will sample a latent variable. We'll then have a deterministic expression that depends on the latent variable and makes use of the parameter. And then we'll observe the data. So we have an element of randomness we can conduct random simulation from the prior distribution, which would here be, you know, a pretty heavily weighted four out of five Bernoulli. So a coin that comes up heads four times out of five. Then we have an observation, which incorporates the data. And then the idea is that we're eventually going to want to say, well, all right, what would the distribution of the unobserved variable be? in light of the data? What is the randomness given the data? And this is part of you know, this broader notion of probabilistic machine learning, where we're effectively always doing um, something like a combination of Bayesian inference and maximum likelihood. If you are a probabilist or a statistician, that's what you care about. And the nice thing about probabilistic machine learning is that when we have some kind of intuitions or prior knowledge about our data generating process, we can use a probabilistic model to write it down and approximate it. The other side of that is of course that writing down a probability model is going to require us to, well, think about our data generating process. And, you know, let's admit the grand dream of machine learning is that we shouldn't have to think our, uh, think about our data generating process. But unfortunately, the no free lunch theorem says that we do have to think about it, whether we like it or not. So I would say, probabilistic machine learning is sort of a trade-off worth making where you just admit, look, I'm not going to get past, you know, the no free lunch theorem. So I'll write down my prior knowledge and assumptions, even if that means I have to spend some time thinking. And hopefully I'm going to have a probabilistic programming language so that once I've actually thought out how to simulate my data generating process, I just write that down with sample for the random parts and observe where I want to incorporate data. 
And then I can do this nice thing, you know, we do in machine learning, descend across a landscape, find, you know, good parameters and good posterior distributions, et cetera. Okay, so in probabilistic programming, we actually have a bunch of different families of languages, depending on what field sort of came up with the formulation. The ones that I've tended to study are those under ML over here, labeled dynamic support. So support refers to what kind of sample space you're dealing with. Can it be continuous random variables, discrete random variables only? Do you have to know the sample space for a program execution ahead of time? Or can it be determined by data and randomness? I would like to give some compliments to this little PL family over here. I have ended up using, you know, pretty much all of their reasoning in order to do my semantics work, even if the thing I program in is more like this ML branch. So then to once again, reiterate the intuitions, you know, in most programming, we would write down some constants or free parameters and a program that uses inputs and parameters to generate an output. In statistics, what we would do is start with, I don't know why this says for statistics that we're going to start with a posterior distribution. Well, I guess in statistics, we start with wanting to know about an unobserved thing given an observed thing. So we'll start by writing down a forward model, which says, here's our distribution over the unobserved variables. Here's how they're linked to the data. And then we attach some data. In probabilistic programming, we sort of merge those into saying, write down some parameters of prior distributions over unobserved variables, write down some program structure linking them to data, add observations, and then an inference engine will take you back up the way you came and give you out some new distributions over the unobserved stuff. Now, particularly if you are a machine learning type of person, you may want to include today's fancy pants neural networks in your probabilistic programs. You may also want to have a support space, a sample space, that is determined by the data and the randomness so that the deterministic fragment of your language is in a certain sense, Turing complete. And then of course, if it's a probabilistic language, you'll want to encode joint distributions over things. And then of course, yeah, it's, it's a programming language. So the one that I worked with most in my PhD was probabilistic torch, which is sort of very, I guess I'd say it's like a featherweight um, deep universal PPL. There really is very little to it other than the tracing structure, which is essentially a probability monad and a library of distributions. So what we're going to talk about today is really what do probabilistic programs encode? And that gets to be a much more flexible question than you would think because every program has, so to speak, one block of source code, but there isn't necessarily just the one way to interpret that source code or to compile the source code. So, you know, formally speaking, operational semantics tells us how to run a program. 
And then the thing is that in actual probabilistic programming, we regularly change and override the operational semantics of our language by actually re-implementing these sample and observe operators in ways that perform inference operations. Then there's, of course, denotational semantics, and that's going to split into two questions. You know, what does a program mean as a forward generative model? And what does it mean when we're using a program to perform inference? Perform inference in itself or for another program, actually. Okay, so the, I would say, simpler and easier question, you know, what does a generative model mean? I did some work on this in my PhD. We're going to go over it. Now, technically speaking, the answer to does a program have a joint density is just yes. Even if you're working with something like a GAN, where you can't evaluate a lot of densities in closed form, you can still talk about it as you know a push forward measure from a series of samples from a uniform distribution. The uniform distribution has a density, so then you have a joint density, but Actually, what we mean is, can I write down a graphical model for my program that will allow me to evaluate non-trivial, that is non-uniform densities? Because most of the distributions I care about are non-uniform. So for instance, you know, any data distribution of images is highly non-uniform in image space, like in pix, you know, in squares of pixel space. Now, in what we call a first-order PPL, one where you know there's statically bounded recursion, or you know, all loops have to be statically, yeah, looping constants have to be statically determined. So everything can be unrolled into static control flow. Yeah, that's a graphical model. And we've got some idea what that is since the 90s. Unfortunately, in a higher order PPL, where effectively you can only write down a graphical model for the past, but not for the continuation of a program, we have to ask ourselves, well, okay, do, are we talking about a measure or a density over samples from the program? Are the samples referring to the output of the program or to the trace of randomness that determines the program output? Are we talking about a causal model or a probabilistic mixture model of causal models? And the answer is, it's complicated, and you can view it in several different ways. So one that I happened to address in my PhD was to say, we want to build up joint densities as we go through the execution of a probabilistic program. So we do want a joint density over the past, which has already been sampled and observed and is therefore fixed and determined. It's a fact. In order to do that, I used this category of quasi Borel spaces, which is ways of talking about how to push forward measurability from the unit interval into a Cartesian closed category of spaces. And in that category, the notion of probability that's used is probability measures, and particularly probability, uh, conditional probability measures, just you know, over a codomain given a domain, or over a target space given a source space. And that means that anything that happened in the middle is marginalized out. You assume that the appropriate output to think about is the program output, even if there may not be any kind of density over that, you know, any kind of sensible density for that measure. 
Now, in actual probabilistic programming, what we prefer to do is accumulate joint densities over all the intermediate random choices so that we can go back and perform inference on them. So my goal in this chapter of my PhD and in this paper I presented at ACT about, sorry, Applied Category Theory 2023, about a month and a half ago now, was formalize this notion of a joint density that is built up as the program runs. The basic idea there was to do so with some machinery from category theory. And that means that we would be using these nice box and arrow string diagrams. The string diagrams are morphisms in the category. This will generalize factor graphs from the literature a bit. And a bit of a TLDR here is to say, look, we're going to have a parameter Z that comes in from the domain. It's an input. We're going to make a copy of it. One of those copies will route down to this thing F that emits a residual M. And that residual is the intermediate randomness. So F we can require to actually have a density. And then we'll take the random variable we now have a density over and the parameter. And that's all the information available and just give them to this deterministic uh, kernel K and say, okay, now generate, you know, now you know everything there is to know in this computation, generate the output deterministically. So we end up having to basically demonstrate that all the outputs from all the Fs so every kind of M you can pick is going to have an appropriate base measure, meet the conditions of the radon nikodym theorem, a bunch of stuff like that. But we do end up saying, okay, now I can separate the random choices that are made as sort of intermediate effects from the computations done on them, which may not admit you know, nice density functions because they might be if-then statements or neural networks or PID controllers or all kinds of other nasty stuff. And then when we want to incorporate the observe operator, we'll accumulate a scalar weight. So the idea being that when you observe something, you say, oh, um, I have a distribution, I have some data. What density does this data have under this distribution? That is now a non-negative real number. I will multiply that non-negative real number into the weight that I'm accumulating through the program. And then as I accumulate residuals and weights, I'm getting a joint density over the random samples with a weight that tells me how closely they fit the data. Higher is better. And we can give nice formulas that say, well, let's compose these forwards. So we can take our components of one joint density kernel and another, and we'll build a new F here on the left from F1, K1, and F2. Then we'll build a new K on the right from K1 and K2. We're remembering what the types of the intermediate randomness are. It all lines up and we can put it into a diagram that has the same form as the previous diagram. Similarly, we can do, we can do similarly almost trivially for a tensor product, which really just means a parallel composition. So sample two things independently, put them side by side. Again, we get something that fits into the same diagrammatic form, 
And what we might be sort of wondering after this is, is that it? You know, where's all the hard stuff from probabilistic programming? Isn't this just an extension of factor graphs and graphical models? And the answer here is that we've included stuff like stochastic control flow through the notion of a direct sum or co-product. So if you understand category theory, then the hard stuff is included, but it's not really a first-class citizen. And as we see on the right here, if we have an actual example in which we write down a mixture model, say we flip a coin and then depending on that coin's outcome, we pick one element of the mixture. That is either the capital delta or the lowercase delta. And you know, really they just get written as a direct sum and sort of packed into their own node in the graph. Like I said, it's not really, the mixture part is not really first class, even if it is actually technically included. And all the machinery for this could be simplified mathematically to a significant degree. So another alternative semantics of generative models in probabilistic programs, or really two more alternatives. One is mixtures of sequences of graphical models. So Tom Rainforth has done a lot of work on this or that uses this point of view where he says essentially, you know, every time you don't have stochastic control flow, so in every block of the program where the control flow is statically determined, all right, then you just have a graphical model. Then when you do have stochastic control flow, now you're picking a mixture component. So then you can effectively say, here's a recursive mixture of sequences of graphical models. I execute the first graphical model. I use the outcomes from it to pick what the second graphical model is going to be, run that one, do it again, do it again, do it again until I terminate. A related but different um, outlook would be to say, let's write probability distributions over these data structures called interaction trees. And this is actually the one that's displayed in sort of this Haskell uh, data type declaration and that I used for doing a bit of formal formalization in my thesis. And here you're basically saying, all right, all the deterministic crap is going to be packed into this continuation so something to free people V, you know, this third argument to both of these operators, sample and factor, all the deterministic stuff goes in the continuation. And what you actually worry about is what the, what the probabilistic operators mean. So we'll have a trivial case where we say return. That means there's just some deterministic value that is the output of the program. Then we can have sample where we say, all right, here's a random variable. We're going to have a name for it, a distribution, and a continuation that tells us what to do with the value for it. And then we're going to have factor, which is effectively observe. And that's just going to say, what's the name for this observation? What's the weight for this observation? And then what is the continuation to run after making this observation? And when you actually unfold these, you know, they turn into these very nice trees that are actually quite akin to what we did in 
Well, I guess for me, it was like elementary probability class in undergrad. Like, you know, you write node is I flip a coin and then on the edges, you can put probabilities and outcome, probabilities of outcomes. So you would have, you know, a node is a return sample or factor. Then you would have on the edges, you know, actual probabilities of going to the next subtree. And of course, a program will encode, you know, an infinite distribution over these. So you have to sort of, you know, like sampling would refer to evaluating one path through the tree. But that still does feel like something of a nicer semantics than like um, string diagrams that sort of hide the random choices and make everything look static. So if you ask me what I want as a semantics for probabilistic programs, then I want something that can capture the causal model that is built into a probabilistic program. And that includes the interventional families. So if I have a probabilistic program with variables A, B, and C, there are interventional families that tell me what happens if I clamp any combination of A, B, and C to specific values. And one design choice you could make might be to say, well, those are actually, you know, a whole family of different programs. But of course, anyone who works with graphical models would say, no, you have one causal model and then you can clamp it to specific values in order to perform causal inference. And we don't just need these interventional families for causal inference in probabilistic programming. We need them in order to just do inference, plain old inference programming. Because if I have a proposal program and a target program, so one program that I want to use to implement sample statements and another one that I'm using to implement observe statements, and I want to combine them somehow to perform inference, well, then I need a way to say one program outputs random values that become interventions on the other program so that I can find out what the observation score would be if I had sampled them from this other program. Similarly, you know, I personally want some sort of canonical interpretation for a probabilistic program where I'm not leaving free the implementations of sample and observe. Like, I don't want to say, oh, anything that satisfies, you know, these type signatures is a valid interpretation of a probabilistic program. No, that, that's not what we mean when we write these programs. If you write that you want to sample from a normal distribution, then in some sense, the correct interpretation is a normal distribution. <laughs> Similarly, you know, I'd like a semantics that lets you reason about where there's going to be a fixed graphical model structure and where there isn't. So that's why I'm sort of partial in a lot of ways to, I guess I would say I'm partial to like embedding graphical models into the interaction tree semantics or something, but we could talk about that later. On the other hand, one thing that the string diagram approach could be good for is following Connell Elliott's idea of compiling to categories. So take your program, compile it to a categorical um, intermediate representation, and then you can do all kinds of optimizations, program analyses, inference programming on it. And now we're going to get into this much hazier domain of 
you know, what does it really mean performing inference or inference programming in a probabilistic program? And I'm going to explain why that's hazy. So if we imagine that we have some joint density, it's got parameters theta, observations x, latent variable z. Since there's no notion of a distribution over theta, we would want to estimate it by maximum likelihood. And then since there are distributions over z, we want to quantify the uncertainty given the data by inverse inference or Bayesian inference. Doing that, the inverse inference step actually corresponds to a third probabilistic operator that we would have to, I'd have to think about whether you can express it in terms of the other two or whether it really is completely novel. And that one is query or normalize, or I hear people call it disintegrate sometimes. We're going to go with query because that's what a, com a bunch of common actual PPLs call it. And so the problem of inference is computationally hard. Well, really all the problems on the last slide are computationally hard because they require evaluating the marginal distribution. And that's an integral. It could even be a high dimensional integral. Integration is hard. And so one of the core things that I have tended to emphasize in talking to people about what's open in PPL or what's open in the domain of PPL's um, probabilistic program inference related problems is we need better and more scalable inference. We always need better and more scalable inference. That is really the thing that has held back probabilistic programming from becoming a dominant paradigm in machine learning and AI in the way that deep neural networks did. Deep neural networks had stochastic gradient descent, probabilistic programming, which was actually a reigning paradigm at the time, had Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. And so basically the rest is history. Like deep learning scaled better even if it was less principled. That's the history. They won. We can try to catch up now, but you know. All right, so how are we going to want to, oh, and one more nasty fact about trying to perform this integration. There is no universally optimal inference algorithm. So for any given marginal distribution, some inference algorithms are going to perform better than others. You can't really just say, here's the one, I am going to throw it at everything. All right, so inference is hard. Let's try sampling. We know that if we take an expectation, which is also an integral, over just the latent variable, so if we integrate over the latent variable, and the thing we're integrating is the joint, then we get the marginal. So why did we move from an integral to an expectation if they're the same thing? The answer is because you can approximate an expectation by just taking a really large Monte Carlo sample and then taking the sample average. So the thing that we can evaluate is this joint distribution. And so we're going to relabel it as gamma of Z, an unnormalized density over Z, where the lack of normalization comes from the fact that X is data and therefore fixed. So at every point in the sample space of Z, there is some density gamma of Z, 
but the integral over all of this might not be one. All right. So then in place of somehow evaluating P of X, now we're going to sample from a tractable proposal Q, which has its own parameters, which we can try to learn. And then we're just going to take the ratio of the two things. So the ratio of the density under Q of, um, under the unnormalized density gamma of Z. And it is a mathematical fact, which we will see on the next slide, that the expectation taken over Q of this weight, this ratio, is the true marginal probability that we're trying to approximate. So now we've taken a prior that might not be um, might be pretty far from the posterior we want to actually sample from. We've replaced it by a proposal, which now has some free parameters. And we now say we'll take a sample average with respect to the proposal of these weights. And generally, the higher the weight, the better the approximation to the target distribution. So in this figure, we might see that, say, the blue line here over approximates the target, which is the orange density. So there's going to be really high weights here of orange over blue and then really low weights over here. And the proposal we might actually want to pick is actually more like the red or the black one that generally has a bit of probability wherever the orange line does. Hmm? Okay. So now let's assure ourselves that this notion of weighting actually works and is meaningful. The density ratio is just like we said. And when we unfold the expectation into an integral, we find that we have Q of Z over Q of Z, which is one. So then what we're really you know, calculating here or approximating by sampling is just the integral of this gamma of Z. And if we substitute back in our original definition of gamma of Z, then we see that we're taking an integral over Z, sorry, an integral with respect to Z of P of X and Z, which is pointwise evaluable. We can, yeah, we can perform that integral and we therefore have the marginal probability we wanted. And this doesn't just work for naive importance sampling like I described here. It actually works more or less in general. So there's a sort of principle we'll call strict proper weighting, which says that a proposal Q capable of giving you samples and weights is strictly properly weighted for an unnormalized density gamma when it can approximate arbitrary test functions by sampling some samples, giving the sample to the test function and weighting by the weight. All right, so that actually provides a very nice statistical and compositional principle for using things we know how to sample from to target things that we that don't have a closed form. So we can use them to sample from the posterior. We can form a 
objective for optimization, which is the log importance weight, and then use Monte Carlo sampling of this plus gradient descent to tune those parameters theta and phi to try and get higher importance weights. So if theta is reasonably high dimensional, then even if we're working with a relatively simple parametric family, we can try and just, you know, essentially throw GPUs at the problem and train theta to try and get us close to the true posterior distribution. Now we can also, you know, treat that marginal probability that we're trying to estimate as a model evidence term. And this lets us do model criticism that is criticism of the generative model P and model selection, which is a form of model criticism. And similarly, once we have samples from, you know, once we have samples that are strictly properly weighted with respect to gamma, we can actually then perform another layer of the procedure to get samples strictly properly weighted with respect to a gamma two or a gamma three. And so there's a nice transitive reasoning structure here as we pass from one target to another. Similarly, you know, this gives us sort of a unifying bit of mathematics for most of the Monte Carlo methods. We work with in probabilistic programming in my thesis, I did happen to work on, you know, this sort of inference combinators library, which is really based on, you know, using strict proper weighting to define samplers that map from one target to the next to the next. The figure here shows how you can use this sort of nesting or layering of strictly properly weighted samplers to implement an inference algorithm called resample move sequential Monte Carlo. And similarly, we can also use them to implement fairly advanced stuff like amortized population Gibbs that Sam and I worked on alongside Hao Wu. All right, but let's really get to the juicy stuff, which is follow-ups and open questions, not stuff that's been done. If we're talking about composable mappings from a proposal Q to a target gamma, is there some notion, is there a categorical formalism of this? I haven't seen one. I'm starting to work on one, but I'm it, it never really comes together and I'm not sure there is one, but there should be one. I don't know. You know, then there's that question of, if you do nested probabilistic programming, so you use query to get a posterior sample from one probabilistic program and then use it as an intermediate step in another probabilistic program on which you then also call query to perform inference. What's the semantics of that? Because then you're not just saying, here's a generative model and I'll override its sample operator sometimes to perform inference, you're actually writing down this other thing where essentially you don't just have to override a computational operator. At times you have to change whether you're working with unnormalized or normalized measures to begin with. And what, you know, and you have to like block off where does your program admit a closed form unnormalized density, which was an assumption that I, you know, I sort of assumed like, oh yeah, all generative models can have unnormalized densities. But like, this is a novel bit of, you know, this would be a novel bit of semantics. Similarly, if we wanted to use string diagrams for not just like box and arrow generative modeling, but also for inference programming, how would we do that? And since everything is sort of integrals in probability land, what semantics would we give to inference procedures that 
aren't actually Monte Carlo. So they may be, for instance, compute a, so for instance, message passing methods will compute an optimal posterior marginal in closed form. But of course, like taking an integral over a product of posterior marginals is not actually taking the integral over the posterior density. So I don't, you know, I'd have to like, I think someone should think about, you know, how a lot of these inference algorithms play with what integral you're actually expressing denotationally. All right, and that reaches the end of things. So we covered, you know, why would you care about probabilistic programming? Well, because you want to do, you know, organic GMO free uh, cognitive science. What it means to write a probabilistic program, you have these extra operators, sample and observe, in addition to your typical deterministic stuff. What kinds of things we can hypothesize that generative models mean when written as probabilistic programs? And the big hazy questions surrounding, you know, what does it mean to do inference programming? Like what integral or ratio of integrals is that? These are a number of my colleagues who I've worked with uh, throughout my PhD. Um, how Heiko, so bottom left is how, then next to the right is Heiko then go up diagonally, that's Sam Stites. And those are the ones who are actually like co-authors on the work mentioned here. The others are some of my psychology side, you know, and EE side colleagues. Um, I've very much valued their mentoring, but they weren't on papers, you know, that we covered here. Then of course, these are my advisors who I've worked with, pre, you know, who I worked with, Jan Willem van der Meint, Karen Quigley, Lisa Feldman Barrett, and this was our funding sources, and it's over. Eli, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, if people have to drop off, it's totally fine because we're at pretty close to the end of the hour. But uh, I certainly have a couple questions, and I imagine other people may as well. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just start, and then other people can just jump in if they have any. Um, I was wondering if you've thought at all about probabilistic distributed systems and uh, you know, what sort of things you could solve that way and also what you could model uh, in a distributed setting. So my first instinct is to basically answer neurons, <laughs> which are a, you know, which are very much a distributed system from their own perspective, even if the time scale is relatively small, you know, compared to what we usually think about. But I think to go beyond that, I would have to ask, you know, sort of what do we mean by distributed? Like, I mean, I guess I'm imagining you have uh, communication, but there's some amount of delay. You might even allow message dropping sometimes. And so you get some non-determinism that arrives, you know, from the interleaving of possible communication, which then, you know, I like kind of fucks with the semantics of the probability distributions, perhaps. Um, it, yeah, that's... That would be the first thing I would think is like, okay, can I, you know, effectively, can I treat like messages being dropped between nodes as something like noise in a Monte Carlo algorithm and just say, look, in expectation, this gets the right answer, regardless of how off, you know, unless you drop all the messages or something or like, yeah. It it definitely like it seems like that seems like an interesting thing to work on, but I will actually confess that when I hear algorithmicists talk about randomness, like my head explodes a little bit because they never tell me what distribution they're integrating over. Yeah, I mostly thought about it because of your slide with the two compositions that you, you know, computed, because like there mm. are more fucked up compositional 
definitions you can get if you start allowing inter like interaction between processes, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, one of the things that I've been trying to work on is essentially once you can put together all those big complex diagrams, you know, can you use that to break down inference problems into little local steps without having to resort to the message passing assumption that you just want local posterior marginals? You showed a prism on one of the slides, and that would be an example where this type of question is interesting, right? Because if you're model checking, if you're doing probabilistic model checking, like you really want to reduce your problems into sub problems that have independent distributions as much as you can. Otherwise, you're going to have a very difficult time proving anything. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, like, hmm. So, Model checking likes, sorry, I've never done model checking before, but are you telling me that like it's useful to be able to do conditional independence assumptions in model checking, probabilistic model checking? I would think so. I've never done probabilistic model checking, but mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I mean, the more independent you could make, uh, for example, if you write a property that has to do with three processes that are communicating with one another, if you can reduce that to three questions, one about each system, mm. that's going to be much easier to solve than having one question about the composition of the three, because the composition like exponentially increases the size of the the actual process, right? Because of all those interleaves. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Lisa works on that stuff, uh, one of Starverse's students. So she would have more insightful things to say than I would. Daniel, Jared, you guys, if you have any questions, we should speak now or forever hold our peace because. Uh... No questions. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Well, Eli, this was super sick. Thank you for talking to us. Um, where You're welcome. People, Thanks for having me. Where should people uh, go if they want to learn more about probabilistic programming or uh... oh, let's see what Jacob said. My question was kind of answered, but I was wondering if you thought about probabilistic model checking. Yeah, I guess I guess not, but. <laughs> yeah, un unfortunately not. I could only fit so much into, you know, a few years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so where should people go if they want to learn more about your work? I and mean, obviously people can ping you directly on the Slack, but other than that, like, do you have any recommendations for uh, learning more about probabilistic programming, learning more about, you know, your work in particular, et cetera? So let's see. Um... I would say if you want to think about if you want to learn about my work, probably go to the chapter two of my thesis, which is really like background. That's where I tried to write down all the lab folklore that I'm applying in all the other chapters. And then my advisor, Jan Willem, has this book, Introduction to Probabilistic Programming. And it really is like it's written for someone who thinks from a programming perspective with occasional interludes that are written from a more statistical perspective. And so that's actually, yeah, that's that's kind of, right now I would say that's the best source. At some point, you know, if all the semantics works work keeps going on, I may just have to like ask someone permission to write a textbook or something. <laughs> Cool. Well, I'll, I'll add links to both of those, uh, you know, next to the talk. Yeah, talk. there's, there's sort of a lot that's presently written down, so not entirely folklore, mm -hmm. but written down and only really distributed in, like, in these fairly limited circles of stats-oriented people. Gotcha. Okay. Sick. Well, thank you so much, Eli. This is fantastic. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time, especially on a Sunday, to uh, hang out and tell us about your work. Like I said, thanks for having me. Pleasure's mine. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye.